it's so important for me to be up to speed on the why behind everything as well. I mean, I've worn wearables because my athletes wear wearables. I've worn, you know, glucose monitors because my athletes wear glucose monitors. I need to understand what they're doing. When you're waking up and you're looking at it every day and you're looking at how many likes after your ride, you're no longer 100% following the coach's training plan because something is a little bit more interesting on a platform. That to me is when it's too strong of a connection. Welcome to the Training Peaks Coachcast. I'm your host, Dirk Friel. In each episode, we'll sit down with industry experts to discuss coaching methodologies, the latest research, and leading tools for endurance training. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources. My next guest is Kristen Armstrong, who is the most decorated U.S. female cyclist of all time and the best female time trialist in history. She is a three-time Olympic gold medalist, two-time world champion, and has won six U.S. national championships. Kristen is the only U.S. female athlete to win the same event in three consecutive Olympic Games. She was also the oldest female cyclist in history to win an Olympic gold medal. Kristen resides in Idaho, where she owns a chain of health clubs called Pivot by KA. I hope you enjoy this insightful discussion where we talk about the good and the bad of data, technology, and social media. Kristen, great to catch up with you. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, I see, uh, is that a special felt, couple special felt bikes behind you there on the wall? Is that the replica <laughs> one? Wasn't one stolen? Yeah, so I have, uh, I have, yeah, all three of my Olympic Games bikes. And um, that one over here is my one from Rio and then Beijing. And this is a replica of the stolen and then my three um, helmets. Um, well, you're being very modest. It's not just Olympic Games bikes. They're gold medal winning <laughs> bikes, right? <laughs> yeah, my, my background became really cool. Um, it was always my background, but when Zoom became a thing um, or whatever platform you use with um, COVID, I just, people were like, oh, that's, that's an amazing background. I can't even match that. I'm like, oh my goodness. Cause my desk is exactly where it's positioned. It always has been. Nice. So I kind of felt ahead of the game. So um, if the call went bad or poorly or people were unhappy, it was always a nice place to lead the conversation to. <laughs> <laughs> I could put the Colorado state junior title uh, trophy up behind me where I beat Bobby Julek. You know, that would be like my highlight. Hey. That is, um, that is worth bragging rights. There's no question. I would actually <laughs> talk sure. about that. <laughs> Take that, Bobby. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, I, neither of us are uh, experts in terms of the negative effects per se, uh, or we don't know all the studies around negative effects of social media on young minds. But I think you are an expert in terms of how to how do you maybe manage it in the field and and with your athletes within your coaching business and i really want to kind of center today around not just social media but technology in general and the signaling that athletes get from technology that includes training peaks you know we have training peaks peaks there's strava segments there's koms there's the Garmin messaging that happens when you hit stop on your Garmin and it tells you how good or bad your workout was today. Really, all of this actually is not really a message coming from the coach, right? It's technology. Then you cross this chasm into social media and how that technology affects athletes' mind, how it, how it affects um, the way you want your athletes to react to, to the, the, these signals coming in. Um, and so I'd, if you could tell us a bit more about the kind of demographics of athletes that you coach, a um, little more about, you know, age of them and um, yeah, and kind of, so we can kind of start there with uh, your experience level, uh, managing social media, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks for having me. I, it's been something, this area of data collection um, as well as just wearables and, um, I guess you can look at the platforms that we would say are somewhat of, though we think of social media as, you know, in the younger age, you know, Instagram and Snapchat. And <clears throat> you think about all these different platforms and, and as coaches and athletes, oh, 
by no means do we think that any of our platforms are social media or a negative because, you know, we're, we're, we're working out. I mean, this has to be a positive, a positive thing for all of us. But now that I'm actually on the other side, I'm not only working with young athletes because our sport is just becoming just younger and younger. Mm -hmm. um, there's some great funnels for youth. And now what we're seeing is the athletes we're working with, my demographic and my clientele have become much younger than my clientele 10 years ago. No mm -hmm. question. And so I am working with kids that are in high school and some of them are entering, you know, they're, I guess, depending on where you live, you could say they're also in junior high. And the top, top performers, as far as like going for Olympic games, they're in their twenties. Yeah. And right. you know, you look 10 years ago and um, I'm working with upper twenties and thirties and 40 year olds. And, and so you sort of are, have a little bit more mindfulness, the social media, my first post on Instagram was um, going to Rio. I look yeah. back, I was like, when did I ever get on a platform like social right. media platform? My first photos on Instagram were going to Rio in 2016. So you think about, I feel like that was yesterday. I know it wasn't yesterday, but it wasn't that long ago. Well, we are tech immigrants, if you will. And you're coaching yeah. tech natives. They right. don't know anything else different. But you and I actually have a before and after. We do. We're kind of, yeah, we're right in the middle. And not only do I have the experience of coaching younger athletes, but I also have the experience of having a 13-year-old boy. And so that is smack in the middle of junior high as well. But um, so the demographic that I coach right now, I coach mainly women. I do have a couple males that I coach, um, a couple young um, under 23 males. But I also coach, um, I would say, in the corporate world, I coach um, some gentlemen that are looking for overall fitness. If you get asked to go on a group ride in the weekend. They want to be just fit enough that they always want to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to go on that group ride. Yeah. Um, so those are their basic fitness goals, which I, I love. Um, but as far as performing goes in those who I see that are well connected with their, their, you know, their wearables and um, oftentimes, you know, they're coming to me and asking, you know, what more can I do? Oh, I've heard about this and I've heard about that. And so as a coach now, I also have to keep up to date with what they're going to come to me with. It used to be I would come to them with this really neat performance tool. Right. And now I'm like, what, what are they wanting that? to wear? Right. Yeah. And so I'll do things where if an athlete comes to me with something, um, there has been times where I actually will go through and I just wear it because I want to see kind of what they're seeing. And I want to learn how that's affecting me as just um, a coach, as well as, you know, somebody who likes to still ride her bike a lot. So um, that's my demographic. And I would say that wearables and the social platforms that we are using to track fitness, you know, are and have been of concern for, for several years now. Yeah. So do you find yourself which which kind of signaling do you accept and maybe bring up to the athlete and kind of like mm -hmm. lean into versus other messaging that's coming through to the athlete that you need like hey hold on i don't really trust that you know listen to me first not the watch or wearable or whatever it might be do you are there some black and white differences between some of this these messages coming to the athlete that you've seen I mean, throw training yeah. peaks in there. Training peaks peaks, yeah. you know, that say they get their, their second highest 20 minute, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, mm -hmm. you know, um, how do you treat that? How do you want them to treat that? Um, yeah. And then, you know, let's talk about Strava and Garmin mm -hmm. and some of these other, you know, wearables. Well, one of the things that is unique about the way I coach and I deliver is, um, and this is, again, coaching has changed young athletes are coming to interview you to see if you're a right fit. <laughs> and, um, to the conversations I have and the topics that um, they're bringing up and what they're interested in. So for example, um, they'll talk about, you know, their background and, and I'm on training peaks and 
I wear whoop and oh, by the way, I lift weights. There's all these things that a young athletes already coming to you right. when they're interviewing you to coach them that somebody along the way has given them or has encouraged them to use. And so some of the questions are from the very beginning of the relationship and they're asking you, um, how do you support that? You know, are you a data coach? Are you not a data coach? And these are coming from young athletes. Mm. And one of the things, and I feel like one of the reasons why um, the athletes I work with have been successful is that I, I do use data. I use data. Would I say I am the geekiest data coach of all in cycling? No, I wouldn't say that. Would I say that I use data every day to drive decisions I make for athletes in their training? Absolutely. I, I couldn't live without data from my athletes. However, I am one where I really do have informed a relationship with my athletes. And so I listen to them. I feel like I take an extra step so that they're not really behind the scene robotic and I can actually guide them and hold their hand a little bit more through the journey. So if there are scores that are showing that they didn't get their best or that they are showing fatigue or the heart rate is high when they wake up or all these different things, I feel like I'm able to control this a little bit because of the way I coach. Um, I am fortunate in the way that I have, you know, a different business. I own two fitness centers, so I own gyms. Uh, I don't know how I got into that, but that's what I do. So on the side, I have a coaching company, but I don't have hundreds of athletes because it's not really, I do a lot of speaking engagement. So it's not something that where I have to um, be super turnkey with my athletes. So it is a little bit easier for myself and my coaching model to be a little bit more hands-on. That's how we've set it up. Um, and if we have more athletes come to us, we hire more coaches. So a lot of my coaches in the way our business is set up is they have income from different sources. Like they might have a part-time job or a full-time job and they've continued into the sport of cycling because they love to manage say a dozen athletes. You know, yeah. it's very manageable. Right. Um, but when athletes are coming and we are talking about um, your best one minute and your best 20 minute and um, going out and not hitting your best. I find that it's great because, you know, your best only come around so often, but I find that there's a lot more discouragement. There's a lot more lows than there are highs. Yep. And so the data that matters to me, I feel like sometimes because the athlete's not understanding how to read the data, they're getting lows from the data. Um, where they get their highs is that same file that comes through training peaks. They're also uploading that same file on Strava. And so they're getting their dopamine hits on Strava, which is what they need. Um, but then nobody really knows on Strava how that compares to the back end on Training Peaks, whether they get their Training Peaks PR or how that looks as far as like their overall um, fatigue for the week. And that can work against one another in a sense, because when you're showing yourself out on Strava, sometimes I feel that um, you may be fatigued but you're still going to go after that QM because you just couldn't resist. Um, and you have to, you know, it's, you feel a little bit vulnerable when you are on Strava feeling tired or you didn't go quite up a, you know, you didn't get 5,000 feet of elevation in today <laughs> and your friends, you know, got 2,300 and, you know, um, I've, I've seen all the tricks. I, I kind of feel a bit older when um, an athlete kind of, uh, does something in training because of the influence of say a platform like Strava. And I, I just say, okay, Kristen, take a deep breath. I don't want to be like my parents where they were like, Oh, when I was a kid and I'm like, yeah. I just kind of sometimes shake my head. I'm like, do you think I was never a kid before? Like, <laughs> um, 
But one example, I'll tell you how influential this is. On Training Peaks, you have your, your goal of um, you have a, a three-hour ride. Great, you're going to go out, you're going to do basic endurance, three-hour ride, get some climbing in. And that file gets uploaded, and the file is uploaded and ends in the middle of a forest. And you're like, that's interesting. How did, how did you end a ride in the middle of a forest? And then the Strava ride, it's a lot more epic. It goes on. Because why would a coach like myself be on Strava following athletes? Like that, she wouldn't be doing that. I mean, that's not something I do. Oh my God. And so it's tough because it's also like, it's a fine line when you're speaking with kids about this potential endorphin or dopamine hit they're getting. I would, I would actually relate it to as difficult it is to talk about, um, weight and power to weight with a female athlete. Like mm -hmm. it is a very difficult conversation to have because it is giving them, uh, you know, it, it happened a lot when we weren't able to kind of be around our friends and others during that right. period of the pandemic. And, and so I think that you have to be really careful around the mental health aspect of all of this as well. Cause you started this whole conversation with we're not experts in all of this. And, and I don't by any means think I'm an expert, but I am trying to navigate it, navigate it on a daily basis. Um, I even navigate the fact that, you know, data being uploaded to your Garmin and now, oh my gosh, thanks to training peaks, you know, for years we've been able to do a workout builder. Yeah. You know, there was years and years where I just go out and do three by 10 minute threshold with equal rest. Like it was that simple. I would get a great warm up in, I'd go out, I give it my best. I turn around, I try to hit the same spot. And now, I mean, heaven forbid if the workout doesn't download because I get text messages are like my, my workout's not downloading. I don't know what to do. I'm like, it's real simple. You have six 20 second sprints today. It's really simple. Right. Right. Think. Yeah. Right. But it's really difficult because everything today is downloaded, uploaded. It's, you know, to a certain percentage. And so, you know, obviously ranges are really important, but at the same time, as much as data and a computer screen can make you anxious if you don't hit a certain uh, goal that your coach has set out, it could also limit you. So think about it a little bit differently. Maybe your coach is wrong by a few percent. Maybe you don't even know your limitations. You know, maybe you're an athlete that um, can, and can push more than you knew you can push. And so I do think that, you know, if you're not a coach that's so fine tuned on that athlete zones by the percent, um, you're, you're holding an athlete back as well, potentially, if you're always using measurables and wearables and, you know, looking at data. And that's why I think that, you know, some of the tools that training peaks provides coaches and athletes is allowing to continually look at trends in kind of the bigger picture over time, because I think that wearables can be great, but it's always going to come down to consistency. It's going to be come, come down to um, what is your individual baseline. And then you can work from there. So that mm -hmm. can even go all the way to, you know, sleeping and recovery and HRV and all these trending metrics that we're using. But if you're not consistent and you're not going to do anything with the data and you're not going to look at it over a period of time and you're going to come up with kind of some ideas because you read an article on this is the norm, then it's, it's, it's not going to work for you. And so when we talk about how I manage my athletes, I have all these conversations with my athletes and it's so important for me to be up to speed on the why behind everything as well. I mean, I've worn wearables because my athletes wear wearables. 
I've worn, you know, glucose monitors because my athletes wear glucose monitors. I need to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm certainly not here. You know, I don't want to be just Strava bashing here, but we need to talk yeah. about how to manage that feedback and that FOMO and sometimes the anxiety that it creates mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. things that they're chasing. So do you ever embrace it and say, yes, mm -hmm. go kill it today. Try and get mm -hmm. that KOM. You know, are there days like that where you just like that becomes the workout? Yeah, there are, you know, I'm going to go back to, I, I meet my athlete where they are. And so mm -hmm. there are some athletes that I know are very connected and I, um, I stay clear of making Strava a goal because I'm trying to help them balance and kind of just not enhance what this platform is or what it's doing because you can already see that it's affecting them in, in so many ways that if I create importance, because I know they look up to me, <clears throat> they're going to create that level of importance as well. And so, but there are athletes that, you know, aren't on it very much. And I find that one of my best, my favorite ways to get a best 20 minute is to go after a segment that's 20 minutes um, and not even tell them because I feel like there's a lot of anxiety when you say we're going to do some critical power testing and, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to do, you know, this is all going to set all your zones. If we do this 20 minute, I'm like, people are driven and motivated by different words and tests and assessments and critical power. And so I work with such a young population that I have to use different fun ways to get the most out of the athletes. And sometimes, you know, the performance is so good that, you know, I have to kind of, you know, kind of, adjust obviously with what they're able to, to train at now because, you know, they get motivated. Yeah. Whereas if, you know, you go out and say it's a test, it's, it's a different story, but yeah, I use, I use Strava. I love Strava. Um, there's a lot of reasons why Strava is great. I mean, it keeps you um, for the general population. It keeps you accountable. Like it gives you goals It those days you're not super motivated. It can give some motivation, but when you're waking up, and you're looking at it every day and you're looking at how many likes after your ride and you truly are, have a coach that you're working with and you're no longer hundred percent following the coach's training plan because something is a little bit more interesting on a platform. That to me is when it's too strong of a connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Unwinding bad like, habits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think that in everyone's different. I think that there are people who, are totally fine on Strava. They don't even, they, they, yeah, it uploads. There's some great like kudos or some great pictures uploaded. Um, there's some great clubs and some challenges, but there are some that have just taken it, you know, one step further. And I can't believe how much this is, is happening in our teenagers. Yeah. Um, so my son is not a cyclist. He is 100% basketball player. Like that's all he does. And he came home the other day and he has some friends that ride Nika and ride. And he came home the other day and he said, mom, what's Strava? <laughs> I heard, I heard you're on Strava. And I'm like, yeah, I'm on Strava. <laughs> and he's like, how do I get on Strava? I'm like, what are you going to do on Strava? He's like, I don't know. Everyone's on Strava. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, you're going to post your basketball workouts or something. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to show? He's like, well, all my friends at Ride, they're on Strava. I want to be part of the conversation. Yeah. That could be, that so, could be positive, you know. Right? Connect, connection yeah, with your friends. Of, they're an active group of kids, right? Yeah. So just because he doesn't go ride or he's not like a, a runner, um, and he's not uploading anything, he still wants to be part of his friend group. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's, you know, there's different things. And again, I, I think that, um, there's a lot of positives. And I think that we all have to look at the big picture and say, okay, how is your athlete or how are you individually connected? Yeah. It's just like anything. I mean, if you are waking up and looking too much at whatever social platform that is, then, you know, we do what we do. Sometimes we kind of let it sit on the side for a while. Um, perhaps we, uh, one great thing is, you know, you can hide your, your profile for a while. You can still keep all the data. 
So I think there's a healthy relationship with everything. Yeah. And I also think there's an individual relationship with everything. So again, going back to meeting people where they are in their journey and um, what do they need? I have high level athletes that, you know, they're like, I need, I need another edge. What, what's my next edge, Kristen? And, you know, they're like, is it this wearable? Is it tracking glucose? Is it tracking sleep? And, um, you know, when it comes down to it, it's all about really looking at, you know, are you fueling really well during training, during races on and off the bike already? Are you not, you know, could this be a good tool for you? Do you have any complaints about your sleep? Uh, I am a huge believer of, you know, why bring things up that are going super well? Because sometimes when you bring it to the forefront, it can it can become an added stressor for an athlete. There's so many things we're trying to be perf perfect at. And sometimes um, I'll make a joke to some of my athletes and I'll say, hey, can we just be just less of a perfectionist? Like, let's just like take a step back for a second because yeah. I think you're overthinking this week. Like you're just right. overthinking this week. Right. Um, but I get it. You know, I was there, you know, you just want to be, you just ultimately want to be your best. Um, but I also, you know, I think I might've shared this story with you before, you know, in, in Rio, when I was lightening up my bike and I had a really hard decision to make at the end because it was a half a pound and, you know, my husband came to me and he had a gram scale out and we were measuring me. He had titanium screws that were going into my bike, replacing the screws that came on my bike. And when he said he could find a half a pound, I thought, well, you already have a gram scale out. How is this possible? And he said, well, you have to ride without power. And this is when athletes started using power plans and when courses would be laid out and they would follow an exact power plan. Yeah. And. I showed up to Rio and I had no power meter on my bike and I don't regret it. It's amazing. And that's my point is ultimately as a coach, my goal is to get athletes to learn about themselves, to learn how to be their best, but at the same time also listen to themselves and know how to fuel, know how to dig deep and hurt, um, and know that when you wake up, no matter if something tells you that you're tired or not, be able to ask yourself and feel like I'm really tired. Cause sometimes maybe you're being told that you're not tired and you are. Yeah. And so I feel like I've succeeded as a coach. If my athletes can wake up and fight a wearable, I yeah. love it when they say, Oh, you know, it's, I, I I'm showing green today, but I'm, I feel horrible. And I'm like, that is more important. Um, but big picture data is also very important. So I love all the collection, but it's how we apply it and use it. I think that's the most difficult. Well, with your lower volume of athletes, I think you place a mm -hmm. lot of emphasis on that subjective, if you will, feedback yes. loop. Um, so it's not all about the data, but talking to the athlete, you know, messaging them right after, during whatever, you know, prior to, um, and you're giving, you're empowering them to go, as you said, against the data, even might mm -hmm. I say your own workout, if you pre gave a workout, are they allowed mm -hmm. to say I was too tired? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I teach them. There are certain workouts that, you know, you're getting the work in, but there's certain workouts that if you can't hit a zone, then we're just going to call it a day. Yeah. And you know, I don't, I don't make up workouts either. It's just kind of my philosophy. We move forward. We mm -hmm. don't dwell on it. We don't try to do makeups and catch up. It, mm. it never ends well. <laughs> um, and, you know, even though, yeah, you know, I have a lower volume of athletes. I do manage, you know, a number of coaches under my company. And one of the things that we do and I couldn't live without is um, our athletes are all required you know, every day after they ride, they write a few sentences in training peaks. Hmm. This is their diary. They might not be with one of our coaches forever, but 10 years from now, when they're with another coach or two years from now, that coach has data. The athlete 
we'll always be able to go back and, and see how they were feeling during certain workouts. Yep. Um, but I always tell them from the very beginning, this is for you. Um, but also every athlete that is coach under, um, KX3 <clears throat> is, um, I'm a shared coach. So every athlete that writes, I'm able to, it pings me every, it's all day. And so when I see things that are, are super important or outlier <clears throat> that I know that, you know, big picture is going to cause a problem or needs to be addressed real quick, that communication system is one that um, is really, I encourage other coaches to look that at when there's more than one coach, even if it's two, or even if you have uh, a buddy system, I really love it because we all have different experiences. And when something triggers, if you can catch that right away, it makes everything just so much easier in the, in the long term. you know? Um, Cause I think when we as coaches get in trouble is when our athletes are trying to be tough and they're not sharing a lot. And then two weeks later is when we're trying to like, Oh, we're trying to unravel everything because we've gotten in a situation. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've heard stories of where an athlete, you know, we have the smiley face and the horrible looking face and like RPE and after the workout and they'll say they felt good or felt great. But then in the comments is like, man, I felt horrible. You know, like this contradictory, you know? And so it, you know, by adding that subject of like flavor and the sentences that you're asking, you know, that you're demanding from the athlete, each athlete's mm -hmm. different the way they express um, mm -hmm. how they feel great or bad. And you can really kind of hone in on that, you know, to the individual level. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that um, getting athletes to learn about themselves, we, we know we're pretty good at learning and knowing everything about our competition, <laughs> but we're not really good at learning about ourselves. And the more we can do this, for athletes, the better athlete they're going to yeah. become. And that ties back into all the data collection. And if I have an athlete that says, Hey, I, I really, you know, I want to wear a whoop, like that's what I want to do. Or I want to wear an aura ring, whatever they want to wear. I don't, I don't go in and say, that is the dumbest thing. No, no, no. <laughs> I support it. And I always just kind of give the, the, the pre-talk, which is, consistency over time. We have to get a baseline for you and never, never, never lose your instinct yeah. and how you feel internally, no matter what. And I challenge you to, when you do look at different data points that you're tracking, I challenge you when someone says, Oh, you know, you didn't get great sleep. I challenge you to be like, did I get great sleep? Did I not get great sleep? Actually, I got great sleep. And yeah. so that's part of also looking at data and how this, you know, wearable looks. And, you know, I use the same thing when I was wearing a, you know, a glucose monitor as well. I was, um, you know, it was really interesting, you know, to see how different fueling strategies were working and how's that led to improved performance for athletes. Yeah. I actually think it's overall, it's, um, created a lot of awareness yeah. around nutritional intake Yeah, because we might feel tired, but we don't really know what's happening. And now that we've become a little bit more educated, and even if you're not an athlete that's wearing a glucose monitor, there are so many articles out there now that you've read how you can perform even better and what athletes are doing now in races to perform even better. But you also have to do that in practice and training in order for it to work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, everything that's come out, I think we've all learned and it's definitely upping the game. For well, science, and yeah. Right. Science isn't going to end. New, the next mm -hmm. new wearable isn't just around the bend. We're going to have continuous lactate monitors here, hopefully five years out or so, you know, that's going to yeah. disrupt things. Um, so, you know, having that open mind, that growth mindset is where it's at and then mm -hmm. helping the athlete navigate that and not placing too much emphasis on it when you're still just learning what even the data means, right. And is there a correlation or not? Um, 
if we could, if we could switch a little more, we've been talking a lot about the endemic technology, yeah. Burning Peak, Strava, et cetera, Garmin. Um, but if we cross over to the more the Snapchat, the TikTok, the Instagram, and this is, this is a necessary evil. And there's been a big change, you know, in our lifetimes, as we said, you know, native natives <laughs> versus immigrants to this whole social media um, landscape. Um, two things. I, I think about, you know, you now to get into certain races or certain race series, you have to apply. And a, a big thing that gets you in, you know, accepted or not, is really, you know, your social media following. And then that leads me into... I don't know if you saw, but a few years ago, Jeff Kabush, really well-known, you know, mountain biker wrote mm -hmm. uh, an article about can an athlete even be an athlete anymore? You know, and mm -hmm. then I start reflecting about my experience prior to technology. You know, I was 19. I decided I have had pretty good success here in the States. Hey, I'm state champion. I beat this guy, Bobby Julek. You know, I'm going to like drop out of school and move to Belgium and give it a go. Now, I had no other data to compare against. I wasn't comparing myself to, you know, the next great, you know, uh, Remco Evanpool or Quinn Simmons or whoever else was out there at the time. I just knew my race results and I didn't have any kind of fear of missing out or anxiety over what I did today versus somebody else. I just was, had this inner drive to the get over there and just see what I can make of myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if in today's landscape, I would have done that because literally I didn't have great results. I was last in my very first bike race. You know, I just mm -hmm. loved the damn bike, you know, and I grew from there. And I think I was better strategist than I was fitness wise. You know, I, I, I love the wind. I love the tech, you know, the, the tactics of racing and that helped me survive. Um, but on pure raw numbers, Olympic Training Center, I went there, a group of 50 juniors. I didn't make the top 20, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yet I yeah. went on and had a successful pro career. I was in Europe for five years and, you know, I was third, whatever. So I just don't know if I could have just been an athlete in today's day and age. And first of all, do that anxiety has just got to be overwhelming for athletes if they're not in the top 20. But yet that drive and resiliency that maybe you and I had, you know, without mm -hmm. technology, you know, is that still there? And, and, but yet you have to build this following to get uh, the next sponsor to get in the next bike race or the next contract. So it's very, very interesting <laughs> that to reflect on our own experiences and what young folks are going through today. I, have said this to many people that I am very thankful that um, my last contract just didn't include any of this. Mm. And now all the contracts are including this. Right. And, you know, I have athletes talk to me about, you know, I have some athletes that are like, I don't, I'm required to do this, but I'm not, I don't want to be an influencer. It's not really my, my thing. Mm -hmm. But that's how I get paid. And then, you know, you have when you hire an agent, because more and more athletes, a lot more athletes, like some athletes, I, I didn't really have an agent until I got to the Olympic Games because a lot of European teams looked at that as like, who do you think you are? You're nothing right now. So why would you need an agent? Why don't you negotiate with me? Mm -hmm. But now it's become so uncomfortable that a lot of young athletes have agents, even when they haven't even produced a significant result. Hmm. And I think that um, not only are agents looked at and what they provide differently, like what do you ultimately want from an agent? Well, I remember agents were like, oh my gosh, they're bringing you like the 10K deals and like you're getting 1099 on them. And you're like, yes, I got some free product and I have all the chamois cream I ever will need in my entire life. Like you're like, I scored, I am a sponsored athlete. And now having an agent, you have to make sure that that agent is able to negotiate a contract where you can make a living. You have to have an agent that also is capable of getting you out in the media. I think that, 
you know, being the face, um, how are you the face of mountain biking? How are you, you know, how are you the face over somebody else a face? Because it's not necessarily going to be from the outcome results that this person is going to be the, you know, the queen of mountain biking or road cycling. And so strategically, how does an athlete do this on their own? Um, you know, at the age of maybe right in college, you know, that, that, 19 year old age, 20 year old age. And so I think it's, it's really, really difficult. And if you look at our different disciplines in sport and you look at where kids are coming up from, they're coming up from high school mountain biking, a lot of them. Yeah. But what I've realized is that's what they know, but they don't really know what they are yet. They don't really know what their strengths are. And so do they kind of just go away because they weren't the six people that make it in women's mountain biking in this country? Right. You know, is there opportunity, you know, to help these athletes get into, you know, different contracts and take a risk. But like you said, there's really nowhere to take a risk because you have to apply to be in races. You can't, the other thing that's gone away is you can't just, you know, hop on, a mixed composite team. Oh yeah. You know, I'm going to go over to Europe and, or, Oh or no, ride a already... tour of, you know, Idaho. Yeah. Right? yeah. Coors yeah, classic, so, you know, et cetera. Yeah. And there's no local teams being formed. And, you know, if you don't get asked to do, you know, a trip with USC cycling and now national teams don't get into the world tour team. So how do you really get, how do you really get seen? Yeah. Um, I know that, you know, there are some teams that do look at other countries' national championships. They're like, oh, you know, that's, you know, the best person at nationals. But you're talking about one person. And and so being an influencer, it's not just happening in our sport, though. It's happening across collegiate sports. I mean, the biggest thing right now is Division three colleges are really becoming the most competitive in sports and academics because it's not a business at Division three. You're... You're going there. You're getting a lot of competition. You're getting a full ride scholarship, and you're getting a great degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, is a certain type of athlete that wants to go Division One now. Oh, and let's talk about, you know, taking gap years, you know, in ball sports. It's like right now, you know, these kids um, that Lucas are, is going to school with. You know, my son's in seventh grade, and you know, kids are trying to figure out, and families are trying to figure out. You know, they're going to take eighth grade off so that when they try out for high school, because they just came out with a ruling that, you know, as long as you're not 20 years old when you graduate, you're good. Wow. 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 So everyone's trying to get ahead. It's a different, it's a different world. And yeah. with that, everybody is, you know, what they're doing, even on the bike at age 15 is what maybe you were doing on your bike at age 21. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you see, again, the you know, amazing stories of athletes going from junior to world tour and like being successful. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and you brought, you sort of alluded to it, but the whole NIL, you know, division mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. it's certainly, I don't believe it's happened in cycling yet, but it's happened in running, you know, local here, Boulder, Colorado kids, you know, are getting NILs to go to college, you know, cause they're mm -hmm. top 10 in the nation for cross country running that might get to cycling someday. Again, I don't think it's happened yet. But that adds a mm -hmm. whole nother level of pressure in high school, right? To gain, get that contract. What level of that is, a t you know, a, a tied to your social following? My daughter is 21, junior in college. She has classmates that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars through social media, being influencers. She doesn't make a cent. And I, I'm just like, I, I'm so, I, I know somehow she's navigated it. She doesn't have a huge following. She's not making any money, but she has roommates you know, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars they're pulling in. That has got to be an immense amount of pressure. Um, so for these athletes that are pursuing that mm -hmm. and getting the, you know, the next 500 or 1,000, 500,000 more followers, um, mm -hmm. do you see this interrupt their training practices, their race routines, pre post race? We had to have these discussions because should we reflect first on the race we just had, or should we post it to, you know, <laughs> to my 1 million followers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, 
it, it, you know, I'll go to, I've been to a couple different, um, you know, little training camps, I'll say, and you know, the, the riders who are doing this because it's constantly just staring at their phone. It's taking pictures of their coffee, taking pictures of their salad, taking pictures. I'm thinking, Oh my goodness. And I have to say, I always take a deep breath because part of our generation, um, we have to be really careful with, you know, too much judgment because it's not, it's, I'm trying to learn what this new yeah. requirement is and I'm trying to understand it better. So then I can guide the people that I'm influencing um, in a performance way. And so I think for those who have made it, it's kind of like anything. It's kind of like those who have made it in sport and getting a great salary. If you look back at how they got in and how they made it, you know, people do end up at first, they go in a little bit of debt. They are on janky bikes. They have janky equipment. They don't have the best tires. I mean, I remember the first time I went over and rode Pave in Europe. I'm like, you know, my tire pressure was probably 105, like, no wonder why I couldn't, yeah. Yeah. right? It's like, and so I feel like that with social media and athletes as well is like, you look at a, you look at a social media platform and you're like, yeah, you're doing that on your own. And you over here, you have content that is just being pushed to you, you know, and professional photographers on the ground. Um, you have sponsors. I mean, you think about like a, being sponsored by a company like Red Bull, every one of Red Bull's athletes, they're influencers, like Mm -hmm. hands down, they have the most amazing accounts because that's what they do. And, um, you know, those that I've known historically that have been part of that. Yeah. As an athlete, you are posting some of your own content, but that content is living and getting pushed to you nonstop. I mean, I've seen content, content that, is beautiful, perfect content that I know for a fact was done, you know, six weeks ago. It's, it's all, you know, it's become a business. It's a stage. It's, and so I think that sometimes what we also forget, it's unfortunate that is inevitable. This is just where we have to go. So if I was in today's world and I was an athlete, if you want to make it, you can't wake up every morning and complain about your salary if you don't want to do it. It's just part of what is expected now. And, you know, that's something where I would um, put in, I would, I would have someone doing mine for me and helping me hundred percent hands down. Like I couldn't do it on my own because it would be a distraction. Um, There's others who, who absolutely love it. And it's kind of like art for them. And it's sort of like, I guess we can call it their hobby, but um, you can't, there's certain things that are happening in our world now that you can't, you have to decide if you embrace it or you fight against it. Right. And if you fight against it, do you ever really win? And I guess that's where it's kind of like, you know, you and I saying, well, when I was a kid, we played all sports. Like I think every kid should play all sports all the time. They should never singly focus on a sport. Range. I'm like, really? Yeah. yeah. Try telling your kid that. And you know, when he's a freshman and he doesn't make any team because he's average at every sport. Like, <laughs> I mean, there are some outliers, but it's the same thing. It's like, I can fight, you know, my son playing year round basketball, but I also know what his goals are. And so to fight that just because that was my generation is not fair. So what I try to do better is I try to understand what's currently happening, happening in the sporting world. And I try to navigate and help navigate. And so I think that same thing goes for, all right, we know it's harder just to hop on a composite team. We know, if you're not on social media, it's going to affect your next contract. So how do you help the athlete navigate options and really deep down inside, what did they want instead of coming out and telling them, well, that's just stupid. Like, yeah, yeah. you shouldn't yeah. do on social media. It's saying, well, what do you want out of this? If your goals are X and this is what they're requiring, then we got to figure out a way to make this happen. Yeah. And creating that healthy, hopefully healthy relationship with that social media. Um, Have you had to set any protocols specifically? I mean, you mentioned training camps and seeing this kind of take Mm -hmm. over, whether at training camps or just working with your athletes that you, you know, have have you run into situations where you have to have had to step in or talk to parents um, Mm -hmm. and maybe put in some, 
some limits or some protocols? Like, is it disrupting their sleep? They're taking it to bed and they're up till midnight. They should be to bed nine, nine o'clock. They have intervals tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough one, um, <laughs> to control. You know, I, as a parent, I have controls on, on my son's phone. He has time limits and he also has when the phone goes off. Mm-hmm. And when it goes on in the morning, mm-hmm. because even when he wakes up, it's still not on, which is a good thing because yeah. you don't always need that to be the first thing you do. But that's just in my house. And I do feel like everyone has kind of a different, uh, what, you know, whether they think their kid's on it or not, but I am kind of, I'm not, Yeah. I'm not the most lenient parent, but I'm also not the tightest parent. I kind of fall in in between. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit of a helicopter, but sometimes I get called that. But (laughs) at the end of the day, I'm really just trying to, it's always, when it comes to social media, I always think safety first at this age. Um, You know, I don't like, I don't like to allow any tracking. Um, I get nervous about just what's happening in, in today's world. And so, you know, but I also understand fully that you want your child to be involved in community and the social aspect of kind of being part of things. And if you're not part of things, um, you know, there's plenty of people that aren't. And my son has plenty of friends that aren't. They have a difficult time having a conversation because it's not just what they talk about at school. And so it's this constant balance of saying, a little bit, but let's not overdo this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think it's, it's great kind of like it's, thing, you know, like you, you have to be careful with going extreme either way. Yeah. You know, and then maybe to turn it more to a positive note, mm-hmm. I remember going to training camps in the early two thousands and I was the bad guy. Why was <laughs> I the bad guy? Because I wanted these professional athletes making maybe a million dollars a year to upload their data to this scary thing so that the team could have access. Like that was <laughs> incredibly bad. I was the devil, absolutely the devil. And I was a oh, devil yes. in the room. I remember. I remember. It. <laughs> I remember. I'm, I was like, what? <laughs> and I'm going to Mallorca and Tenerife and all these. And I like literally there were some grand tour winners that would not do it until I flew over and had a glass of wine with them because they had to like meet the person, the wizard behind the screen, you know? Yeah. And, and now you, you show up to a world tour team, you've got your data a lot like out there publicly shared for the last eight years, mm-hmm. you know, it complete pendulum swing in like 12 years. Like it was just, insane to think about the differences of this generation versus the old. Right. Um, but mm-hmm. so the positive to that is that we are getting word out about our sport. They're getting more followers, We're, you know, women's, you know, cycling is coming back up after the first tour de France, how many, you know, so there's positives of getting our sport known and then the athletes known and spreading that. And then it's bringing value, you know, to the brands that are, are really, you know, doing great things, you know, for the sport. Um, and there is more transparency. Why was I the devil in the room? Because of all the dirty stuff going on behind closed doors. We had to expose mm-hmm. that. We had to like level the playing field. I think it's much more level now. Um, hopefully I, I think it is. And that's why we're seeing some of these great young athletes actually making the jump, um, quicker. Um, so there's positives to this openness as well, but this, this balance between the two of it can be very, very, very evil, create a lot of anxiety, really Mm -hmm. mess with young minds, lose all kinds of confidence, FOMO, all that bad stuff. But if we balance it right, they can, it can build confidence. They can build a career, you know, and, and, and they get more, uh, I guess it's more transparent at the end of the day, which is a lot better than how it was in the eighties. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I can't imagine, you know, this is just an evolution from, you know, you can look at whatever 
period of time. I mean, there's always an evolution in something. And this is kind of like data evolution. This yeah. is like social media evolution. And there are always positives to every, every like jump we make in our sport. And like you said, some of the positives are um, our sport is known. I mean, it, people are watching our sport now. It's um, I love that I can actually watch, um, you know, some of my athletes race, especially the mountain bike world cups. It's one of my favorite disciplines to watch. I can watch the women race road races at not in a million years. I mean, I'd be on a pay phone in France trying to call my husband and tell him how I did. I mean, yeah. my calling card, I mean, that it's crazy. It's, you know, how quickly things have evolved. And so it's all great. I think when it comes down to it with everything we've talked about, it all comes down to, and I use this word a lot. I, I love intention. Like as long as we, you know, it's about positive relationships with what we're using and measuring and who our community is in the environment we're surrounding ourselves by. So whether that be your team physically in person, whether that be your community on social media, is it positive? Are people nice to you? Or they just like have such things that you go away and you are crying in bed because it's so hurtful what they said to you. Is it positive and what is it, is it bringing you um, more to your game? If it's taking away, then that's when you have to really say, oh, this is making me overthink. This is not, this is causing me a lot of stress and anxiety. But as long as the takeaways um, come from in, like the intention behind it and you're able to take, you know, from this collection and these learnings and um, you're able to have like actionable items, I think depending on who you are, a lot of these things, they're all positive. That's why they're on the market. That's why people are using them. That's why they're successful. It's just when a relationship becomes negative. Yeah. You know, it's no different than a coaching relationship when, you know, you have a bucket and if, if your bucket is empty and your bucket is, you're not kind of sharing back and forth. Uh, there comes a time where it's just not a great, a great relationship anymore. Yeah. And the same thing goes for any platform, any data. If it's not creating positivity when you wake up and you're like, yes, like this is, this has brought so much level up my game. And that's when you're like, you know, I'm just going to put this aside for a while. Yeah. See if you miss it. Empower the athlete to put that aside when they know it's it's mm -hmm. getting a little too much. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for all your insights and great experience in this. And uh, it's always helpful being a parent having discussions because it's a different oh. perspective, right? And mm -hmm. um, then you can have those, you know, discussions with your athletes. And so, yeah, thank you so much, Kristen. It's been awesome. And uh Good luck with your, your work and your, your gyms, your health clubs, and, and your coaching. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate it. It's all fun. I like a mix of things. So, <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Training Peaks Coachcast. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources.